Hello there. This is Elena and my channel Enough. Uh, today we're going to talk about my book, which I published in 2017 in one of Russian websites. Uh, the name of the book is Future of Russia. How to become a normal successful country. Today I translated one chapter of this book. It's called uh, Chapter 4, Corruption in Russia. Uh, as you probably know already, Russia has a very high level of corruption. Uh, to be more precise, we will look at this website, which called uh, Made by Transparency International. And this is called Corruption Perception Index. As you can see in 2021, and judging by the color, you can also see that uh, different countries have different levels of corruption. Russia, for instance, uh, the score is 29 out of 100. Uh, how does this index work? Um, the closer to the zero mean high level of corruption, the closer to 100 low level of corruption. Let's compare Russia, let's say with my other country, Canada. Canada is 74 out of 100. It means it's quite low level of corruption. United States, which Russia really likes to compare itself to, scores 67 out of 100. So it's worse than Canada a little bit, but way better than Russia. There is nothing to compare. Uh, and if to talk about Ukraine, 32 out of 100. So still to compare Russia with 29 out of 100, even Ukraine looked better. Even there were times when Ukraine had really, really high level of corruption, even worse than Russia, which is again is Russian fault because Russia was ruling basically Ukraine and Russia made it corrupted. So when some people in the West started to tell me that, oh, or even in Russia especially, oh, everywhere is bad, everybody is corrupted. No, it's not. The level 29 in Russia, I mean, and it was in 2021. Right now that level probably closer to a zero because there is no law in Russia. And corruption can do, especially right now as Putin proclaimed the martial law, it's basically wide open for corruption. You can do anything you want. You just pretend to be, you just need to be government official who would say, well, it's for necessity because of the war. Let's, well, ah, they can say the war. They could say special operation. It's temporary. It's uh, a little bit of martial law. Yeah, just uh, just a few, a few places. So, like always in Russia, it's a lie of Putin. He lied about partial mobilization. It's not partial mobilization. It's full-scale mobilization. It's not partial martial law. It's full-scale full -scale martial law. And since I lived in Russia and I lived in countries with low level of corruption, and I can say I had never bribed anybody in Canada. Well, neither I did in Russia, but many people did, and I saw it. It was in front of my very eyes. People were bribing police officers, especially road police. Russian drivers are basically driving with the, uh, money, American dollars, by the way, in their driver license, just in case they're going to be stopped in Russian police. In my time, like I left Russia eight, over 18 years ago, that's what was happening. The same thing was working in USSR and so on. And the difference is Canadians know where the Canadian politicians live. They know where the Canadian Prime Minister live. Americans with their level of corruption know where American pre uh, President lives. Russia doesn't know where Putin lives. Nobody knows where he sleeps every night. If to talk about my own experience uh, in Canada, when I visited Ottawa for uh, travel, uh, in roughly, uh, it was 2010, basically, uh, we went to the Canadian Parliament and to the Parliament of many Canadian provinces. I have been in the Parliament of Let's say British Columbia, Nova Scotia, PEI, Alberta, any, lots of provinces. There was no way even metal detector. There was a couple of rangers sitting at the desk in many places, which just more like a tour guide would say in which part of the parliament you can come and see. They're not checking your documents, they didn't check in anything. Except for one place, in the main parliament building in Ottawa. And what happened there? 
There was a little bit of a lineup standing to the metal detector, and me and my husband uh, was waiting in line. And then he attracted my attention and said, well, look at this man. And in about a couple meters from us was standing Canadian acting Minister of Finance. Standing by himself, no bodyguards, in line like everybody else. This is the difference between corruption in Canada and corruption in Russia. I would never see Russian Minister of Finance standing in line, let alone without bodyguards. Neither one of the officials, like if you're trying to get into the parliament of, let's say, big region where I lived, it is about <laughs> bigger than France, probably. Uh, you have to go to the special place, you have to be invited, then you, they have to have a paper that you invited, you have to have your documents, like passport, then you go to the special room and they're writing you a paper that you can enter the building, and then you go through another side of the building, through the main entrance, whether it would be police, at the time it called militia, uh, standing at the door, they will check your documents, they will write down that you entered the building, with the time when you entered the building, and then you will come out of that building. Then we'll mark that you left. And you will again have to tell that you're leaving and probably show you the do show your documents. So this is the difference. And in terms of corruption, Russia is the worst of the four countries that I showed you. In 2021, before the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, Russia was on 136th place out of 180 countries and territories. Russia was in the same place with Angola, Liberia, and Mali. That is the difference. It would seem that everyone in Russia knows about corruption. So why do Russians still trust the authorities? After all the lies they were fed and they are continuing to be fed. Russian leaders are such patriots of Russia. They believe in its future and boldly promise the people good life and prosperity. If that's the case, why is their money is on in the bank accounts in the other countries and not working for Russian economy? Why do their children not only study but also stay to live in, in the other countries? Why did they redistribute the sanctions personally imposed on them by the other countries in connection with the illegal seizure of Crimea and the Magnitsky Act so that the blow fell on ordinary innocent Russians? This was by no means the goal of the goal of foreign states. This wasn't by no means the goal of the foreign states. I live in one of them and I know it for sure. That's not what foreign countries wanted when they put sanctions on Russia. About the Magnitsky Act, I will give more details in the end, at the end of this video. These countries have already tried to ensure that the sanctions imposed on citizens of the Russian Federation and Russian companies in 2014 and later doesn't affect the population of Russia. And what we see? Russia's retaliatory sanctions are hitting the common people of their own country way worse than any other foreign sanctions. Why does Russia need those retaliatory sanctions? Other countries are almost completely independent of Russian economy. Well, several of their businesses will suffer, and that's it. This I wrote in 2017. And now, after the full-scale Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2022, the situation changed. Russia began to blackmail the world with hunger in, in developing countries and a complete shutdown of gas in Europe. And many other things. Nuclear strike, for instance. And the Russian people are not indignant of the country. On the contrary, many of them support the government and rejoice. Here we will show them now. I mean foreigners. Truth to be told, Russia won't, won't show them anything. They just don't look at Russia. Even in 2022, Europeans will only lower the temperature at their businesses by a couple of degrees or close a couple of extra rooms in their houses to save on electricity. But the Russian economy is in danger of collapse. We will discuss economy in a separate chapter. Uh, in connection with the Magnitsky case, Russians should have said thank you to the foreigners for giving, hand, giving a hand to punish their thieves and bribe takers, since they couldn't do it themselves. 
Instead, Russians defended the thieves. Also in 2014-2017, Russian government destroyed some foreign food products that fell under Russian sanctions. This was a terrible thing to do. It is awful to destroy good food in a country where there are hungry people. There are people who are living before, below the poverty line and there are poor pensioners. But Russian authorities at the time took funds from the pension fund and compensated the losses from the sanctions to the oligarchs. They certainly were not starving. And although the state Duma then rejected the Rotenberg, Rotenberg's law, a controversial law on compensation from the budget for unjust, uh, as Russia thinking, decisions of foreign courts in the first reading, uh, foreign courts against the um, uh, Russian oligarchs, in the first reading, uh, legislative in, um, initiative was approved with minimum majority votes. According to Ross Business Consulting, the State Duma rejected Rotenberg law in April 2017. But in the first reading, the law was accepted. Only after the protests, the authorities realized that it was too imprudent and decided to go around it. They said, the members of the parliament came to the conclusion that there is no need to introduce the proposed sanctions to the legislation. The norms necessary to protect the interests of citizens and the states have already been passed. This is from the same source, from Ross Business Consulting. So, Russia was compensating out of pension fund to the oligarchs who suffered from sanctions imposed by, uh, to them by foreign countries. Imagine that. Imagine that happening in any other civilized country. Imagine it in Canada, in the States, in France, in UK. I don't think so. It only can happen in Russia. Why are sanctions so scary for Russian officials and oligarchs? It's because they keep the accounts in foreign banks and in foreign currency, not in rubles. At the same time, they keep saying that they believe so much in the Russian economy and its future in the future of Russia. Putin and Russian oligarchs buy real estate abroad so that they have somewhere to go when they completely spoil Russia. Of course, they don't like their accounts are blocked and they are denied entry to European countries, to the United States or Canada or Australia, because they don't plan to live in Russia forever, until the end of their days. They have already purchased real estate abroad. See, for example, a film about Dmitry Medvedev or the film Chaika, which I'll talk to you and show you later, and about the oligarchs in England, uh, which I will show you a little later today. And now maybe they don't have a choice. They have to stay in Russia, which they destroyed for years. How sad. I wrote this in 2017 and I was right about it. And... Um, this is my channel, and I'm talking about corruption in here as well. And there is a playlist, whole playlist about corruption, which I'll show you a little bit more later. Uh, in 2022, after Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, sanctions finally began to target Putin personally, members of his family, his mistress, and the mother of his children, Alina Kabaeva. Uh, who is the head of media holding that distributes propaganda in support of the war in Ukraine, as well as oligarchs and Putin cronies who are in power. The fish rots from the head, there is saying in Russia. Uh, the information about corruption of Vladimir Putin personally and his close people, uh, his relatives and his uh, mistress and his wife is in my video, Putin incriminated himself in corruption. Uh, in this particular video, law. When uh, Putin incriminated himself basically during the meeting with Hel in Helsinki with the president at the time of United States, Donald Trump. And also I provide a lot of information about from that video you can you can go and check out different different information about Putin's corruption and corruption of his wife, Lyudmila Putina, and so on. And this is an interesting article uh, by Dossier. Uh, 
It called billions for Alina. They're talking about Alina Kabaeva, Putin's mistress and mother of his children. Friends of Vladimir Putin, it says, uh, made 32 billion rubles. On resale also gas shares. The money went to buy TV channels for Alina Kabaeva's national media group, which is that media group is uh, guilty of promoting war in Ukraine. Uh, Kabaeva herself, um, they're talking about her... They bought in Switzerland, near Colonia, uh, one of the most expensive and respectful in Switzerland and in the world. Uh, it's not too far from Geneva, on the, on the lake. Um, they bought a house and um, even... Uh, that's not the house, this is, this is it. Basically, because it has a helicopter pad. And so she can use it. She can fly right there at uh, Putin's friend Chimchenka has his villa there. And uh, near the house of the Timchenka and that building they bought, there is only one helicopter pad. So she can, she can fly there by helicopter. And uh, it wasn't business flights or anything. It's her personal, personal place. And visits and so on. And the price is there. Uh, 75 million uh, Swiss francs. About 75.5 million dollars. US. But that's not all. In the end of the article it talks about. Um, how much. Kabaeva and her family. Personally. Personally has. That's Kabaeva, Alina Kabaeva, and that's her relatives. Lyubov Kabaeva, Lysan Kabaeva, and so on. So, on the total, 2 billion, 500 million Russian rubles. It's about 40 million dollars. Yes. That's what we're talking about. Corruption. Now let's see how daughters of President Putin live. This is about... Uh, this is a channel called Medusa. This one article is in Russian. I'm not sure there is in English or not. It's from 2015. About another Putin's daughter, Maria Fassin. And the investigation of raiders at the time and also in some other sources they're talking about Katerina Tikhonova, uh, another Putin's daughter and about their, their corruption and so on. Um, at the time Maria Fassen worked, um, uh, was candidate of science and she was in, working in scientific center in Moscow and so on. And uh, One of Putin's daughters live in, lived in Netherlands for a while. Basically until uh, Russian inv Russian uh, Russia started war in Ukraine in 2014 and Russian backed separatists knocked down M MH17 flight in Ukraine. So she kind of had to leave. And the other Putin's daughter has a villa in France for almost 3.7 million euros. Do you have a villa in France? I don't. Uh, and this is another article from um, 2016 by Kanev, Sergei. It's called First Daughter of the Country. And he is saying in his article that um, last 16 years was super secret uh, all everything about President of Russia, his family and so on. And now it started to surface. Mostly because of the journalist investigations. And um, Russian taxpayers Paid for the paid their taxes, which provided good life to the president of Russia, letting Putin become one of the richest, if not the richest person in the world, and his family. Uh, the investigators find out that youngest daughter of the president, Katerina Tikhonovna, Tikhonova, who was at the time uh, chief of the company in the practica, 
she was uh, taking part in a project for developing Moscow State University in uh, 110 billion rubles. And her husband, Kirill Shamalov, at the her husband at the time, Kirill Shamalov, in 33, uh, he was 33 years old. He was uh, own uh, 2.85 billion dollars. Even Ludmila Putina, which I showed in my video uh, in here uh, about, I'm talking about Ludmila Putina. And her new husband also benefited from the Russian taxpayers and so on. So at this point, in, the, in this article, they talk more about Maria Putina, this lady in the middle. And you're welcome to translate it for yourself if you like. And this Medusa also talking about uh, relatives, Putin's relatives, nephews and so on. And there are lots of them. And they're also stealing from the country. I'll give another link to the independent magazine uh, talking about P Putin's daughters. And this article from 2017 uh, about Lisa Piskova. She is a daughter of Piskov, which you can know as a spokesman for the Putin. She told about her life in France and she was saying that she doesn't want to leave Paris and so on. She was 19 years old at the time. And uh, so for every normal person from uh, democratic countries, it's no big deal to live in another country. It's no big deal to go from country to country. Uh, Canadians could live anywhere they want and so on. But for Russians, it's not. Why not? Because the propagandists and Putin himself and Lavrov and everybody else saying how horrible is the West, how everybody here is so bad and corrupted and wanted to get Russia and they just so such a bad people and so on. And yet they live abroad, they have accounts abroad, their family lives abroad, their children don't even want to come back to Russia. This is very, it is, it is disgusting. Another, and disgusting that they are lying about foreign countries. Meanwhile, it's okay for them to live there. It's okay for them to have accounts there. It's okay to lie to Russian people and steal from them and hide this money like a rat in some other countries. This is another interesting video I want to show you. It's called Putin's Way. It is in English, so I can recommend you to watch that. Tonight on Frontline, with Russia in economic crisis and tensions simmering over Ukraine, the world is watching Vladimir Putin. So you can watch that. It's in English. It's from April 2017. It's you can see more information about what was happening before. Um, another interesting information happened, uh, we acquired from the Pan Panama Papers. The Panama Papers are 11.5 million leaked documents or 2.6 terabytes of data. It was published in the beginning of April 2016. The papers detail financial and attorney client information for more than 214,000 offshore entities. The documents, some dating back to the 1970s, were created by and taken from foreman, former Panamian offshore law firm and corporate service provider Masak Faneska. And um, there was lots of information in those documents, uh, financial information about political officials from 50 countries, politically exposed persons meaning the ability to influence decision-making and the corruption risks associated with this, as well as their family members, friends, and business partners. Uh, there is information uh, in there about 140 politicians. 12 of them are former or current heads of state, including the prime ministers of Iceland and Pakistan, Ukrainian president at the time, Petro Poroshenko, 
President of the United Arab Emirates and the King of Saudi Arabia. In addition, there is data on the accounts of the children of the President of Azerbaijan, the late father of British Prime Minister at the time, David Cameron, Jan Cameron, relatives of Chinese President Xi Jinping, and Vladimir Putin's entourage. And the investigation at the time also involved friend of President Putin, cellist Sergei Raldugin. Several offshore firms in Panama and the British Virgin Islands turn out to be registered to him. It follows from the report that people from Putin's close circle transferred at least $2 billion through offshore companies. The Russian part of the investigation is mainly devoted to the friend of President of Russia, Sergei Raldugin. He is not only a virtuoso cellist, but also godfather of Maria, one of the daughters of President Putin, as well as minority shareholders of Russia Bank, businessman Yuri Kovalchuk. As follows from the published materials, Raldugin owns two offshore companies and turn, turn over of one of them exceeds $2, million, $2 billion. It seems suspicious to the journalists that these offshore companies were making lucrative deals with large Russian companies. According to the media, their owners had insider information. Some of the transactions were cancelled after some time due to the fault of Raldugin, a major partner of the offshore company. The same firm received significant funds from the failure of the contract. These offshore companies were also forgiven millions of debts. One of Raldugin's firms also held 12.5% 12, 12 stake in uh, Video International. It was created by ex-minister of the press Mikhail Lesin, who died in the United States. There was an interesting article at the time uh, called uh, Panama Gate President of Presidents and uh, by Alexander Bratersky, Dmitry Kirillov, Olga Alexeyeva and Andrei Vinokurov about what the world leaders, how they're going to suffer after the publishing of those Panama Papers. Uh, and um, I was surprised that Mr. Raldugin made that much money. Who would have thought that the musicians in Russia earned that much money? And what was the reaction on the published data? In Panama, they were checking the legality of the activities of Masak Faneska. In Germany, they were going to amend the law of money laundering uh, to come up with a mechanism that would allow revealing information about the true owners of the offshore companies. The Prime Minister of Iceland has resigned. But the press secretary of Vladimir Putin, Dmitry Peskov, said that the main target of the investigation is the president of Russia, and the task is to undermine the domestic political situation in the country before the elections. Peskov also denied that his wife, figure skater Tatiana Navka, she was mentioned in the investigation, had companies in Panama. And Putin said that uh, yours truly is not on the list. He talked to Ria Novosti in April. Uh, He's saying that uh, there is nothing to talk about. Dmitry Peskov a few days later said that called the investigation and not a stuff in that claims to be objective. And he said that Kremlin expects the continuation of information stuff in Iran against Vladimir Putin and Russia. So basically, they're using all the old KGB tactics like what about ism and just flat deny. They just deny everything. They deny facts. They deny reality. They deny everything. That is why Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny and his team fighting the corruption in Russia. And I showed you that uh, his channel before. This is how people and Navalny what they do they do investigations with proofs and facts about different uh, politicians this one is um sorry this is a uh, this is playlist about dmitry medvedev former uh, he, he was a prime minister then president of russian federation and now from a relatively trying to pretend to be democratic guy, uh, he is now one of the biggest uh, pro-war in Ukraine and uh, threatening the world with nukes and everything kind of guy. So this is the whole um, playlist about his um, his corruption. But mostly we want to see that video. 
It has English subtitles. It called don't don't call him Demon. Demon it's like a like a short name from Dmitri. It's done by Alexei Navalny. It's in English. You're welcome to see that video, and um, there are facts and proofs in that video, and so on. Um, the uh, Anti-Corruption Foundation identified and documented Prime Minister Corrupted Empire, which consists of a network of charitable organizations in the name of his proxies. The oligarchs and state banks pumped up their charitable funds with their bribes, and then the money was spent on the construction and purchase of luxury real estate in Russia and abroad. And, and how the authorities answered about that uh, revealing of those facts and proofs. Medvedev called nonsense and some pieces of paper, the compromising evidence, allegedly collected on him. In the movie, they also talk about businessman and oligarch Uzmanov. By 2022, that Uzmanov had an estimate net worth of 19.5 billion and was among the world's 100 wealthiest people. Usmanov made his wealth after the collapse of the Soviet Union through metal and mining operations and investments. He is a majority shareholder of Metal Invest, the Russian industrial conglomerate. Uh, so that businessman and oligarch Usmanov demanded to ref uh, refute the statements made in the videos and in the text of the websites of Navalny and the Anti-Corruption Foundation, and he sued Navalny. Navalny refused to refute the claims about Usmanov, even the uh, court in Russia fully satisfied Usmanov's claim against Navalny. Of course it did. It's a corrupted country. What did you expect it? It is interesting that Mr. Usmanov, Putin and uh, Medvedev didn't uh, himself sue Navalny. They just sued him through that Usmanov and they demanded to remove the whole film, even though Usmanov appears only in a part of the film. Yet Navalny refused to do so and now you're welcome to see that video. Another investigation was uh, called the Seagull, uh, Chaika. Chaika is a surname, uh, the surname of uh, the prosecutor general of Russia, Chaika. And talking about uh, Artem Chaika and Igor Chaika. Igor Chaika is his son. This is what this video is about. In May 2014, the Greek press was full of reports of an extraordinarily lavish new hotel called Pomegranate, a five-star marvel on the seafront in Halkidiki, a very popular tourist destination in mainland Greece. Judging by the interiors, the investors spent tens of millions of dollars on the decor alone, and staying here is not cheap. Renting one of those rooms will cost you $4,000 a night, though that does give you access to the basement which houses an enormous spa complex built out of solid marble. The opening ceremony had a distinctly Russian flavor, thanks to the MC, pop star and celebrity Philip Kirkorov. Alongside him were acrobats, showmen and magicians, all flown in by charter flight from Russia, no expense spared. The florists and lighting technicians were Russian too, as was the keynote speaker, Vladimir Medinsky, culture minister of the Russian Federation. Russian businessmen, regional governors and politicians listened to him attentively before enjoying the show. At the grand finale, fireworks and lasers lit up the building with a gigantic Russian flag projected onto its side. Who paid for such extravagance? What businessman is so important that the culture minister himself flies in to congratulate them on their new project? You might think the only Russian businessmen capable of such extravagance would be the billionaire oligarchs that are household names in the West, but you'd be wrong. This video shows the hotel's owners cutting the ribbon. That is Artyom Chaika, son of Russia's general prosecutor. Very few people would recognize him. So, this video is about corruption of Chaika family. 
and his papa is a Russian general prosecutor, the main prosecutor in Russia. And um, what about the reaction of that? The State Duma rejected verification of the uh, uh, Anti-Corruption Foundation about Medvedev and about Chaika. And Putin and Medvedev were trying to close the Anti-Corruption Fund. Again, it was completely dismissed. Nobody was cared to look at the evidence or facts or anything in Russia. And so is other Russian uh, oligarchs and uh, main people in the government. This is, as you can see, Sergei Lavrov. Uh, the video called Yachts, Bribes and the Mistress. What is Minister Lavrov hiding? And it will talking about all of that. Какая стыдоба на самом деле. Реально не ведомство, а позор России. Выполняют самые грязные путинские делишки. То кокаин по миру возят, то прикрывают попытку убийства Навального химическим оружием. Ну а параллельно министр тихонечко разворовывает сам МИД. Катает всех на самолетах. Показывает мир любовницы, маме любовницы, племяннице любовницы, дочке. Пристраивает их на работу, отдыхает с ними на яхте. С такими друзьями врагов не надо. И все ему ничего. Поймают... И ладно, он просто еще раз расскажет о том, какой Путин великий. Придется объявить ему замечание, выговор, потому что он с этими секретами с нами не поделился. Ни со мной, ни с представителями спецслужб России. Как против России ополчился весь мир. А потом, ну, чтобы совсем наверняка, помолиться. Можно, пожалуйста. И все, вот он лидер федерального списка «Единой России». Но самое лучшее наше открытие мы сберегли на самый конец. Открытие, за которое Лаврова не то что должны снять с выборов, его должны посадить. Потому что сам Лавров и его семья много лет находятся на содержании у олигарха. Он оплачивает им отдых, они летают на его самолетах, они плавают на его яхте и живут в его домах. Из данных о перелетах семьи Лаврова мы узнали, что вторая семья Сергея Лаврова буквально пользуется самолетами Дерипаски как своими. So basically, Oleg Deripaska, Russian oligarch, supporting the whole family, two families, by of Minister of Foreign Affairs Sergey Lavrov. He is to you English-speaking trolls who was so happy to see Lavrov uh, talking to the giving interview to Rosenberg to, on BBC and was saying that we would love to have Lavrov in our country. This is a thief and a uh, cheater and basically he's a uh, <laughs> this man uh, Deripaska basically supporting Lavrov and his family and providing him with lavish and luxury and everything stolen from Russian people by Lavrov, by Deripaska, by Putin and there are all the documents who saying about that and so on. This man Vladimir Solovyov, one of the main Russian propagandists, the guy who is talking about the war in Ukraine so much, supporting uh, any brutal action against Ukrainians, who was saying that, oh, everybody abroad is against Russia, the other countries are so horrible, and urges army to invade Britain and seize Stonehenge, and saying that we should nuke Britain or something like that. He's just such a patriot of Russia, isn't he? У Соловьева талант. Он меняет свою точку зрения моментально. Переобувается прямо в воздухе. И каждый раз он врет душевно. От чистого сердца. Вот он против власти. Оппозиционер. Администрация президента, которая схватила все, что было в стране за последние 10 лет, показали, что они не могут сделать нашу страну богатой и развивающейся. Но эти уродцы держат вот просто вот так щупальцами всю политику. А вот он, путинский патриот-государственник. Мы верим в Путина и мы верим в Россию. Вот же он совсем недавно говорит, не дай бог, если Крым вернется в состав России. Я хочу спросить, обсуждается ли возможность возврата Крыма России? Да не дай бог. А как вы себе это представляете? 
А сейчас перевернулся на 180 градусов и остался таким же верным своим новым идеям. Этот день мы приближали как могли. Крым и Севастополь снова в составе России. Историческая справедливость восторжествовала. В Украине живут братские нам абсолютно по духу, по крови, по общей истории люди, война с которыми является самым страшным преступлением, которое все можно только придумать. Не надо кричать «Севастополь наш», не надо кричать «Крым наш». Конечно же, в Италию. Что ли дело Италии, страна? He has his villa, apartment, cottage in Italian villa for Demir Solovyov, this video called. And he's talking about Italy, country with no corruption. А именно, сюда, на участок на берегу озера Кома. Вот прямо тут, у кромки итальянского озера, и пустил корни наш сегодняшний герой. Разговоры о доме Соловьева на Кома ходили давно, однако сам счастливый владелец не утруждался их подтверждать. При любом вопросе он сразу начинал оскорблять всех спрашивающих и блокировать их. Но ничего страшного, сейчас мы вам все расскажем, докажем с документами и, главное, покажем. Берем выписку из итальянского реестра недвижимости и... And... So this is basically his, and it's just one of his villas. It's not all of it. There is another video about about uh, Solovyov. He has. It said you will laugh. He has another villa in Italy and Maybach. That's uh, name of the other video. Согласитесь, виды просто фантастические. Не случайно именно здесь приобрели себе дома такие люди, как Мадонна, Джордж Клуни, Джани Версаче, футболист Рональдинья, Сильвестр Сталлоне и многие-многие другие. То, что мы видим прямо сейчас, это коммуна Минаджо. Одно из лучших мест на Кома. Она со всех сторон окружена горами, что создает свой особенный микроклимат. Посмотрите, какие замечательные дома, какая красивая архитектура. А вот из этого, например, дома на вершине холма вид должен открываться, ну, просто захватывающий дух. Можно позавидовать тому, кто там живет и, как мы видим, строит себе бассейн. О, кстати говоря, смотрите, какая прелесть. Мы видим, что на бельевой веревке висит какая-то одежда. А давайте просто из озорного любопытства приблизим и посмотрим, что же там сушит этот счастливый итальянец, наслаждающийся одним из самых красивых видов в мире. Хм, как интересно, какая-то форма или мундир. So this is another villa of, on the same lake nearby of... Mr. Solovyov, luckily he is under sanctions now, and he's not gonna see it soon enough. Uh, and many others. This is the... It's called... Um, Secret Billions of Prime Minister Mishustin. That's another Russian. 
It's Russian Prime Minister. Бор высокий какой. За забором Российская Федерация. This is Moscow. Рублева Успенская Highway и Николина Mountain. This is where the Russian oligarchs lives. То есть прямо так и написано в свидетельстве на право собственности. Российская Федерация. Зачем же тогда отгораживать эту Российскую Федерацию от той Российской Федерации? А все дело в том, что в той Российской Федерации живет новый премьер-министр России Михаил Мишустин. У него таких российских федераций много, потому что сейчас все наше государство прячет Мишустина и его имущество. Везде, где была фамилия Мишустин, написано теперь «Российская Федерация». Вот журналисты за первые 10 дней премьерства Мишустина много чего раскопали об его имуществе, но документов на него нигде нет. Везде только «Российская Федерация». Но от фонда борьбы с коррупцией не скроешься. Мы собирали досье на Мишустина аж с 2015 года. So that is kind of Mr. Uh, Basically, living better than English rich in London. There was very good BBC documentary, Rich Russians, Rich Russian and Living in London, and from Russia with Cash, which was published in 2015. Uh, in the summer of 2015, the British TV channel 4 aired the investigative film from Russia with Cash about how money stolen from Russian state budget flows into London luxury real estate. The film was filmed with uh, hidden cameras, and for everyone except the film crew, the events taking place in it were absolutely real. The main role was played by a member of the uh, supervisory board of the Anti-Corruption Foundation, a former banker, Roman Borisovich. Following the film release, British Prime Minister at the time, David Cameron, promised to publish, to publish a register of 100,000 offshore property owners in the UK, including Scotland, and to consult to develop legislation to help prevent money laundering in the UK. And on November 3rd, 2015, the multi-party anti-corruption MPs group organized a screening of this film in the UK Parliament. The deputies of the House of Commons and the members of the House of Lords present at the screening during the debate approved the proposal formulated by Roman Beresovich to require all offshore corporate owners and of real estate to disclose their ultimate beneficiaries. Beneficiaries. The proposal was going to be presented to Downton Street in a consultation process. And now let's talk about the Magnitsky case. Uh, I'll told you about in my previous video about Russian Untouchables, uh, the four films, the Magnitsky files about organized crime inside the Russian government. And they in Russian and in English, these ones are in English. In previous episodes of Russian Untouchables, we showed you how Russian police officers and tax officials helped steal $230 million from the Russian government, and how Sergei Magnitsky exposed them and ended up dead. Today, we're going to show you who murdered Sergei Magnitsky. Most of the information in this movie was gathered by Sergei Magnitsky himself shortly before his files were taken, and he was arrested by the same officers he testified against. Uh, this was a film four, but there are previous videos also. I'll give you the link. And the response of Vladimir Putin was, of course, typical example of avoiding the answer and what aboutism. So after that was discovered, and uh, the United States, Canada, and a number of other countries, which were outraged by the theft of so much money from the Russians and what happened to Magnitsky, decided to punish those responsible for corruption and the death of Sergei Magnitsky. Those countries imposed sanctions against these people, banned them from entering their countries, seized their bank accounts in the US, and so on. The money was stolen from Russia, but the authorities of the Russian Federation not only didn't try to investigate and arrest the criminals, but on the contrary, demand of lifting sanctions against them. And they blame the United States, who punished the thieves for everything. What a hypocrisy! The Russian authorities blamed Magnitsky himself, despite all the evidence presented in the film. And, beside the film, they were presented to the Russian government as well. 
Well, if to think logically, if anyone stole so much money and get away with it, would he or she draw the attention of the authorities to the scam and demand an investigation? Why do that? If you are an honest person, you would not steal at all. And if you are a thief, and even a lucky one, why on earth would you expose yourself? It makes absolutely no sense, except that high-ranking Russian authorities were involved in the crime, and it benefited them to cover it up. The most horrible thing is that the unfortunate orphans turn out to be the victims as a result of the Magnitsky case. Children who could be adopted by the Americans are now doomed to stay in orphanages. What a horrible cynicism. Canada and a number of other countries banned corrupted, corrupt officials responsible for the death of Magnitsky from entering their countries and blocked their accounts. What was Russia's response to the revelations? Russia hit the children with the law of Dima Yakovlev. By that law passed, Americans were forbidden to adopt children from Russia. Even the cases of the adoption, which were already moving forward, were stopped. For those poor children, the best thing that could happen to them is to be adopted by foreigners. These are sick children, and it will be very difficult, if at all possible, financially for Russian adopters to raise them. They would have had a great future with the families abroad. I personally know 11 families with adopted children in Canada. The kids are from different countries, not from Russia. And the kids in the, those families are doing great. The new parents don't divide their children into blood-related and adopted. They love them all the same. They take them to Disneyland, they educate them. There are also children with special needs among the adopted children that I know. And the new parents take care of them, love them, educate them, treat their illnesses. And now, for many seriously ill children, their life is over. An orphanage, even a very good one, simply doesn't have the means to help them. In Russia, I personally know only one family with adopted children. Just Russians, first of all, can't afford it. And second of all, there are a bunch of laws which prevent Russians from having more adopted children because um, according to the law, uh, the family should have a certain amount of square meters uh, per person. And the Russian apartments are very small. If you born your own children, not adopting them, you can live in one tiny apartment, probably the size of the kitchen many of you have. It could leave uh, two parents, two grandparents, and a couple of children in the in your kitchen, basically. But you can't adopt a child because for him wouldn't be enough uh, space. But if you born these children, well, that's okay. You can have three children in there, more. It just whatever you can. Uh, so the Russian authorities pretend to care about children, not to allow in these terrible Americans to adopt them. Of course. Nothing bad ever happens to children in Russia. Let's see what the situation with children in Russia. Uh, this man is the uh, Lev Schlossberg, Russian politician, human rights activist, and journalist. This gentleman. And that's what he said about Dima Yakovlev's law in the meeting of the Pskov Regional Assembly. He was against it, and he was saying that this law is cannibalistic, savage, shameless, and vile. Everyone who voted for this law becomes guilty of the potential death of a child who the Russian system couldn't cure. Только после того, когда российские усыновители отказались от ребенка, он может быть передан на международное усыновление. According to Russian law, says Mr. Schlossberg, only when Russian people cannot adopt the child and the child has a serious health issues, only after that he can be adopted by foreigners. В минувшем году в 2011 году российскими гражданами было усыновлено 7416 детей. In 2011, Russian citizens adopted 7416 children. А иностранными 3400 детей. And foreigners adopted 3400 children. При этом у нас в стране погибло в приемных семьях 1220 детей за 15 лет. In 15 years in Russia, in adopted family, in family with adopted children, uh, died 1,220 children. Just a second, I'll confirm that. Погибло в приемных семьях 1,220 детей. Yeah, 1,000. 
220 children in 15 years. 15 лет. А в проклятых США 19. And in that horrible United States only 19 children. 1,220 versus 19. И это статистика, официальная государственная статистика. And this is official Russian statistics, which is lying all the time, by the way. But this is even by official Russian statistics. That's what's happening. И 50 тысяч детей возвращены из приемных семей российских в детские дома, потому что люди не справились ни материально, ни методически. 50,000 children were returned back to orphanages because people could not have them. Either by financially or some other way, like 50,000 children were adopted and then returned back. А из иностранных приемных семей возвращен один ребенок. And from foreigners, the only one child was returned, returned back to the orphanage. Нам с вами, уважаемые коллеги, должно быть абсолютно все равно, где несчастный больной ребенок обрел свое счастье. For us, dear colleagues, it should be doesn't matter whether poor child with uh, lots of illnesses find his happiness in Russia or abroad. That's what's saying Mr. Schlossberg. There is also interesting article by Moscow Times. Child abuse in Russia is a routine. December 25th, 2012. That's what talking about Magnitsky Act and so on. According to various estimates, 50 to 95 percent of children who grow up in Russian orphanages become drug addicts, alcoholics, or commit suicide. Russian orphanages essentially produce children who suffer from Mogul syndrome that is all ill-equipped to function in any capacity in society. And this is, yeah, this is a very interesting article. You're welcome to take a look. As for myself, I visited orphanages once in Russia. Uh, my son at the time was um, quickly growing out of clothes. He was just born and I had a lots of uh, also brand new clothes, which didn't suit him for some reason, and uh, I bought some food, some apples, some cookies, and so on, and I brought it to an orphanage, and I was offered to meet children, and I did, and it was so horrible. Like, it was a good orphanage, by the way, doesn't seem corrupted, children seems to be have toys and clothes and everything, but what I saw horrified me to the rest of my life, like, the eyes of those children were the eyes of, like, little old people. They were just sad. They didn't have family to love them. They didn't have their own mother and father, even the adopted ones or um, uh, by birth. No matter how they will, well they were treated there, they were just unhappy. They that unhappy that I just couldn't stand it. Like I, I cried after that, and I, I couldn't adopt them all. There was too many of them, and I didn't have enough space. Also in my apartment, and it's just. It just was awful. So basically for a corruption, they punished children and not allowing amazing foreign families, which I know in Canada, who could have adopt them and give them decent life, amazing life, give them own mother and father. It just, they were forbidden to adopt them because that was the punishment. Pay back for the sanctions applied to Russian oligarchs and thieves. And... That's how the Russian oligarchs dealing with children. It just, I agree with Schlossberg on that, it just was cannibalistic law. And this is another article from Novaya Gazeta newspaper. The article says, Patriots of Russia choosing Miami. So that's where the Russian oligarchs choose to live. That's where Russians, rich people, choose to live. The leaders of the Russian Federation don't believe in their own words about the future of Russia. They export capital abroad, buy real estate there. Their families members don't want to live in a country polluted by the activities of their relatives, the Russian officials. So they move to the democratic countries. Unfortunately, most Russian people have nowhere to go. They themselves will have to fix life in Russia. I don't understand why tolerate and encourage thieves and corrupt officials. They won't share with Russians money they stole from them. Why tighten their belts, starve and overwork, die in the war and let their children to be killed or starve when Russians can get rid of corruption and live in peace with the other countries? Despite Putin lies, the countries of the free world not only want but loan for peace with Russia, good friendship and business relations with Russia. 
this is another uh, investigation of anti-corruption fund about it called billions of the sick and poor the thieving methods of tatiana golikova uh, who has made money of the pandemic? More than a million Russians have died of COVID-19. But there are those who have truly enriched themselves of it. Russian Deputy Prime Minister Tatiana Golikova and her husband, former Minister of Industry and Trade, Viktor Kristenko, have made billions of rubles of an HIV medications and childhood vaccinations over the years. And when the pandemic struck, they profited from that too. They made so much money that they could afford to live like the richest people in the world, fly private jets, sail yachts, have expensive hobbies, and buy villas in the most beautiful places in Europe. And even the war in Ukraine did not stop them from continuing doing so. In 1999 году Владимир Путин, тогда еще премьер-министр, опубликовал программную статью. Она называлась «Россия на рубеже тысячелетий». Статья о том, с какими планами Путин заступает первый раз на должность президента, какой станет Россия под его управлением. В тексте было сказано, что российская экономика будет развиваться так хорошо, такими темпами, что уже через 15 лет, то есть к 2015 году, Россия перегонит Португалию по ВВП на душу населения. Там же, видимо, в первый раз публично Путин произносит знаменитую фразу «Сроки на раскачку в стране не отпущены». Сколько раз мы ее слышали потом. Португалию мы так и не догнали. Ни к 2015 году, ни к 2022. ВВП на душу населения по-прежнему в два раза ниже. И вместо того, чтобы развивать экономику, заниматься наукой, предпринимательством, догонять Португалию, наши молодые соотечественники погибают сейчас на бессмысленной, преступной войне, которую Путин начал. Чтобы посчитать все, что нажила за свою жизнь семья из двух чиновников, Татьяны Голиковой и Виктора Христенко, нужно сильно постараться. Самолет, гольф-клуб в Испании, три гольф-клуба в России, виллы в Испании и Португалии, недвижимость на Лазурном берегу и в России, инвестиции, доли в фармацевтических компаниях, даже экзотические штуки, вроде покупки их паевым фондом депозитарных расписок, мы тоже посчитали. Просто из любопытства, ну, интересно же узнать, сколько наворовали за свою жизнь Татьяна Голикова с мужем. И у нас получилось 50 миллиардов рублей. И это, скорее всего, нижняя планка. Это только то, что нам удалось найти, доказать и посчитать. А реальная цифра, она гораздо больше. And another thing I wanted to show you uh, is about... Oh, maybe not this time. Uh... So this is how Russian corrupted politicians stealing money from Russia. And this is outrageous. Why do some Russians, not just Putin, have imperial ambitions and want to rule the world? Why do they need it? I can say that this will not happen. Anyway, we'll talk more about that in the future. I believe that Russians should remove Putin from power, stop the war in Ukraine immediately. Withdraw their troops from all Ukrainian territories, including Crimea and other annexed territories. Charge Putin and his oligarchs with the war crimes and more other cri many other crimes and pay reparations Ukraine, to Ukraine. Russia needs to ask and accept help from other countries and improve life in Russia for everyone, and not just for a handful of people who already live better than every anyone else. And conclusions. Russian people should be taught real history, not the lies that Putin tells them. All empires, including the USSR, came to an end and collapsed. Why do Russians need to step on the same rack again and again? Without defeating corruption in Russia, it is impossible to build a good life for everyone. The same applies to other countries of the former USSR. Russia losing the war in Ukraine. will be one of the necessary steps to create a better future for the people in Russia. This will completely expose Putin's lies and put an end to imperial sinking in the country, or so I hope. There are a few more steps that need to be taken, but we'll talk about that another time.
at this point uh, thank you for your attention and have a great time of the day please like and subscribe the video on how to spread the truth please help ukraine it will help russians as well see you later